Ah, good old Sniper Elite. We've watched it grow from a young buck into a full-blown war criminal in what feels like no time at all. Its time in North Africa was fun, but it met this one chick and she's Italian and it's completely changed its whole personality for her. I don't know what's going on. On Twitter, all Sniper Elite's bio says is back on my bullshit and has a link to an MLM. We'll have to see how this all shakes out. All right, so there's a lot that's changed from Sniper Elite 3, so much so that I'm going to put all the noteworthy stuff in its own section because otherwise my brain will scream at me. For mechanics, I think the biggest one you'll notice playing the game or watching the series is that Carl took a little siesta in the Animus and is now parkouring like a monkey if the object he's climbing is painted yellow, of course. For how rudimentary the climbing system is, it was a great step towards making the maps, which are now larger, way more interactive. The verticality is off the charts. By this point, I'm sure you're sick of me saying this, but I'm all for the developers rewarding player exploration. As I played, I would see an area I was meant to go, say assassinate someone or take out some guns or a spotlight, and I would then look all around that area on my map and see what the most creative or engaging way to take it out might be. Once again, there's only 8 levels in the base game, but these can take forever if you play like me. Each one of these took at minimum an hour and a half to complete because there's so much to see. When I would die, a little part of me was happy because that meant I got to try it the other way. Take another route, use another tool to complete my task. And while I made the joke that Carl can only climb things that are yellow, it is a great way to remind people like me who have played all the Sniper Elite games in an 8 week period that this is the game that allows you to climb things. Plus, it's not going the route of Assassin's Creed where there are some questionable surfaces you can climb. Everything makes total sense, both for being realistically climbable and being in an appropriate location. These chains, these should be here. These exposed beams should be here too. Although it does look a little cartoony when Carl slides down this pipe. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go slide down the drain pipe right now to show you how real it is. Another mechanic that they introduced that is so cool when it works is the ability to shoot these loads. We're introduced to it in the tutorial at the beginning and it's so friggin' cool, but uh, if I had to count how often enemies organically walked under them without me having to lure them, I wouldn't have any fingers. Does that joke make sense? For how often you see them, I wish they were a bit more effective, but I also understand their limitations. I love this theme that Rebellion has fallen into where the last missions of every game are something of a precursor to the gameplay we see in the next one. Like in V2, we had the DLC mission Newdorf Outpost, which inspired the world design of 3. And in 3 at the end, we had to shoot a pulley to take out the rat. It's like as development is wrapping up, they just start to throw stuff at the wall to see what sticks. It's iterative game design and I love to see it. Honestly, that's one of the reasons I give Rebellion so many breaks when it comes to their games. People are so weirdly critical about the Snipe Relief franchise, but they're clearly innovating and having fun, so I mean, who gives a fuck? Did that statement feel a bit like a trap? Come on, I'm not the single best gameplay mechanic introduced by Snipe Relief 4. Oh, oh no. Oh, you're too kind. This was such a surprise. But yeah, the trap system is unreal. But specifically, I'm talking about the ability to booby trap bodies. That's right. Take those Geneva conventions, and throw them right out the window. Desecration of a corpse. Sergeant Slither approves of this message. Besides using rocks to get the enemy's attention, we've lost the ability to start a fire, but Carl learned to whistle during the break, and he uses it to catcall every black shirt he can find. This menu might look a little busy, but we'll get to it later. The point is that we now have an ability to call an enemy to our actual location, which honestly makes corralling them easier. Maybe it's just me, but I find this to be way more effective to lure them into traps. You've got your mines, you've got your TNT, and almost everything has a secondary fire mode. But if we get an upgrade, I think it's only fair the enemies do too. Their AI has received a massive upgrade, and it's honestly nothing short of fascinating. First of all, they all have a purpose. You have radio men and elites, both of which are capable of calling reinforcements and rallying troops. But this isn't just a switch that gets flicked in the back end. You they have to actually go through the animation of loading a flare and firing it into the air, for example. Which means if you see one of them about to do it, you can focus fire on them. I love this sort of signaling to the player. But even better is watching how they interact and how the hierarchy of all the soldiers is actually shown through their gameplay. Take this situation for example. As the enemies closed in on my last known position, the privates went first, they tossed a grenade in to clear the area. and the whole while I can hear an officer barking an order and a soldier responding to that order. The days of Sniper Elite 1 where everybody just bum rushes your location are over. They're almost surgical about it. 
It's pretty amazing. I got to watch this take place, but when they're actually closing in on you, the heat is most certainly on. Hell, the only reason I was still in this area was because they had me surrounded. It just so happens I managed to hide first. In other AI activities, they will respond to events you cause now too. If you sabotage a generator, they'll walk over to investigate it. Hell, you can rig those to blow up too. Remember when everyone was freaking out because they couldn't tell what was cake and what wasn't? That's the world of Sniper Elite, but everything's rigged to blow your nuts off. Speaking of which, remember my review for three, I complained that you couldn't shoot out all the lights? If you don't, you can watch it right here. Well, guess what? In this one, you can. I haven't found a light I couldn't take out. Even for the lights that are hanging here, for example, the whole light moves if you shoot it. So not only is the bulb an actual object you have to hit, you can really set the mood and check out the great lighting by having the hanging light swing around like we're about to interrogate someone in an 80s detective thriller. I think they call this a Guantanamo strobe light. My personal favorite though has to be shooting the paper lanterns in the mansion level. The visual detection system is back, but in a bit of a different way. See, in 3, it was this little eye, but it didn't tell us much about range. There was a lot that was left up to interpretation. Remember how I said the most important thing in 3 for me was that Rebellion made me guess less? Well, they did it again, but even better. If you watch the little circle on your minimap, it expands and contracts based on the light source you're in to show you what radius in your immediate vicinity you're visible. But this wouldn't be an analog nightmare review if my biggest takeaway wasn't some super small addition that most people would never notice. And for this game, ladies and gentlemen, Carl finally started doing shoulders. When we aim down sights, we can change which side of the body we're squaring up with. Keep it up, Carl. Looking good, buddy. Oh, speaking of looking good, let's get into the new interface that's so busy, I think it requires its own section. All right, so let's start with the loadout. The first difference you'll notice here is the skill tree. And uh, I gotta say, if you're someone that hates skill trees, you're gonna love this one. One because you get two options per level. Would I like to see more? Maybe, but I think they're paced well enough that after every second mission or so, you're going to have enough XP to hit the different level ranks. Also, all of them are mildly useful, so there's none that feel absolutely essential. I was able to tailor the skills to my play style, but it didn't bug me or make me feel like I was missing out on the other choice. You can change your scope too, but why don't you just follow me down to the weapons because this is where it gets different. Just follow me for the changes and uh, try to keep up. First thing you'll notice is the variety of weapons. Might just be because I've unlocked a few and have the season pass, but there are a bunch. What I will say to you is this, if you're gonna play Sniper Elite 4, then pick your weapons early and stick with them. You'll notice there are upgrades available. You can see how to unlock those by going under the upgrades menu. The reason I say to pick your weapons and stick with them is because there's a lot that are unlocked with just regular actions that you'll do in the game anyway, so you can unlock these as you play without feeling like you're grinding too hard for them. Sometimes you might just have to keep in the back of your head like, oh, make sure to go prone before you shoot someone, but there's nothing too complex. Also in this menu, you can see the available skins. They're all reasonable, you won't find any weed leaves here, Snoop Dogg isn't going to come out and personally toss Carl Salad 4500 sniper elite coins, but that's fine I guess. Oh, there's not too much else to talk about here. You have your item selection here. By the way, check this out. These bars make it look like you haven't unlocked the item slot yet, but uh, nope, you can click it. Don't ask me how many levels I've completed before figuring this out. One interesting inclusion item-wise is the suppressed rifle and pistol ammo. These really change up the way the game is played, and I credit a lot of my enjoyment of Sniper Elite 4 to the silenced rifle ammo. But once again, like Rebellion or Wizards, they address the issue of having no reason to use the non-silenced pistols by including suppressed pistol ammo. In the mission selection screen, you can see the mission challenges and progression bar, which is fucking dangerous, let me tell you. I haven't 100%ed any of these missions yet, but I fully intend on getting True Jedi. There were collectibles in the previous games, but they were all pretty run-of-the-mill, so I didn't feel the need to talk about them much. The same kinds are present in SE4, which are readables, and I found narrative items, but in addition to that, there are two new collectibles I wanted to call out. The first is safes. Saves? Safes. Safes. Oh no, if you look at the word safes for too long, it stops making sense. These are sometimes part of the main story missions, and sometimes an ancillary collectible, but still very cool. You can choose to either blow them open with a satchel charge, which is the loud way, or locate Locate an officer in the area, murk him, and take the safe codes off his body.
The other is called a dead eye target and revolves around sniping stone eagles usually perched in a gargoyle-esque fashion around the maps. V2 had the ability to break wine bottles as a collectible, but sniping fine art from across the map is just so much more satisfying, especially like this one time where my bullet traveled through space and time. Next up is presentation. Starting out with a big feature touted for SE4 is the binaural audio simulation. It's essentially a way for the game to calculate what sounds you should be hearing based on your location and proximity to certain surfaces. It's like ray tracing for audio, sort of. But hell, it tanks your performance the same way actually, so yeah, ray tracing for audio. When I used it, I didn't notice a huge difference in audio immersion, but I did notice my frames immediately started dropping like crazy. Just leave it off, it's really not essential. There's a lot I could talk about, but as always, I'm going to prioritize things that stood out enough for me to notice them. I'm sure the ambient design of pigeons fucking in an attic is great, but if I didn't experience that, I can't exactly talk about it. I'm totally joking. I'm there in spirit whenever two pigeons consummate their pigeon marriage. First, I really like how Carl sounds. As he's running, you can hear the jingle jangle of his bags. Depending on what surface you're on, it actually sounds like 200 pounds of muscle with gear strapped him as walking in boots, especially when climbing. Although I must say, if you're playing this game with headphones, turn that SFX volume the fuck down. It is so loud out of the box. And since you hear this noise... Every time you pick up an item, there's only so much of a pounding your ears could take. I got jump scared by how abrasive it is once or twice when I picked up an item without meaning to. And selecting targets with your binoculars? Fuck me, it's like Carl is letting out a shop gasp every time he sees someone. For graphics, what I can say, it's Italy. And this is the most gorgeous sniper elite yet. The character models, however, run the gamut from great to... Carl looks fine, this I expected, but this fella named Giancarlo is probably one of the best characters this game has to offer, and he looks like fucking Sid the Sloth from Ice. Sniper Elite 4 is based around the Allied invasion of Italy in 1943. We see Carl visit various locations around Sicily and mainland Italy. He's essentially a bloodthirsty Rick Steves. Or just Rick Steves. Oh no, that weird little tingle in my brain. Uh, okay, 1943. We're not given any specific date, so I can only... Anyway, as a reminder, Carl works for the British SOE, the Special Operations Executive. SOE is exactly what it sounds like. It was the key force in conducting espionage, sabotage, recon, and other types of irregular warfare against the Axis. The SOE has a large amount of history and even more mythos. Just listen to the awesome nicknames attributed to the SOE. They were called the Baker Street Irregulars, Churchill Secret Army, and the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Any one of those could have been a new wave band name. The sharp tacks among you who also chose to remember sniper elite lore instead of calculus will remember that Carl is technically American, but works for the British because of his dad's ties to the organization. But in Sniper Elite 1 and 2, Carl is working in Germany for the American OSS. This is because those games technically take place later on the timeline, making Sniper Elite 3, 4, and 5 prequels. Sniper Elite 4 is where we actually see Carl start to work in tandem with the OSS. Our introduction to the OSS is via Jack Weaver, an OSS agent liaison to the SOE and the various partisans in the Mediterranean. I hesitate to call Weaver Carl's handler because, as we all know, Carl cannot be handled. But he very much does the thinking, so that Carl doesn't have to. Before we get into the mission analysis, I want to make a brief shout out. Okay, for context, I do a bunch of research for these videos. I feel like a lot of the stuff that's out there is wildly inconsistent, and I want to be known for getting details right. In doing this, I usually hassle the developers of games that I'm reviewing with questions, and I, I just don't hear anything back. Until today, that is. Yes, that's right. The absolute beast that he is, Colin Harvey, narrative designer and Sniper Elite 4, emailed me back. He couldn't tell me anything. 
I completely forgot that developers are under lengthy NDAs and he couldn't really share any details. My initial reason for bugging him was to find out what places are real and what are made up for the game. I know some of them are clearly made up because you can't find them on a map, but I wanted to know if there are any just simple name swaps. The answer, most of them are made up names, but they're based on real locations. However, he was able to provide a pretty hilarious anecdote. According to Colin, the art director for the game decided that Colin had that way about him. He was handsome, suave, and looked suitable evil. So Colin's face actually served as the inspiration for the main villain in the game. I'm going to show you right now just so I don't forget to do it later. Quickly just look away from the screen if you don't want to see who the bad guy is, but this is it. If you want to support Colin in his current pursuits, he's actually got a book coming out that he's crowdfunding for right now on Unbound, titled The Hero Never Dies. It's a look into storytelling in the digital age. If you're a fan of my kind of analyses, I think this would be a great read. Once the book comes out, I'll probably do a giveaway or something for it. And as a disclaimer, I was not paid or anything to promote the book. I just really wanted to do Colin a solid from one creator to another. He didn't have to email me back. He didn't have to take time out of his day to give me, you know, what little he was actually allowed to talk about. So go support him if you can. Thank you again, Colin. Okay, so the first mission and tutorial is on San Salini Island. And oh man, this is a gorgeous game. I know I've said that already, but this is just a brilliant space to play in. This is the sort of game I would say to play during like the winter, especially if you live somewhere that gets really dark and cold. This mission starts in 1943, and it actually picks up where the last game left off, seeing Carl and friends jump from North Africa to Italy by way of the island of Sicily. Instead of Churchill being the brand name the game gets to throw around, this time it's General Eisenhower. Anyway, as Carl is en route to San Salini, we get updated with this game's premise. A captured Italian ship called the Orchidia is dispatched with some experimental radar equipment to monitor German radio traffic when it's intercepted by an enemy plane. The plane uses some cutting edge new missiles that can be radio controlled and they function a lot like a kill streak from Call of Duty. Once they're fired, they can be driven essentially in whatever direction is required. We're on the island to take out some of the Luftwaffe's top brass, namely General Tobias Schmidt, which if you ask me is pretty dumb. Probably could have sprinkled a little bit of opium into a rat trap and Hermann Goering would have come running. Okay, maybe not running, maybe like a little tweaky power walk. So yeah, the point of this game is back to rockets. And to be honest, one that I think is suitably less world ending than the previous games have been. Like this technology definitely sounds dangerous in the wrong hands, but it's not a new. We don't have the fate of the world on our shoulders. Speaking of carrying some weight, there is also a great balance struck with Carl this time around. At the beginning of Sniper Elite 3, he sounds edgy as fuck when describing the British soldiers who don't want him there. He doesn't just sound like a loner. He sounds like that guy that thinks listening to an inflammatory dickhead podcaster, you can fill in the blanks with whoever you want on that. That one without headphones on public transport means he's going against the green, unlike those other sheeple. But this Carl, he's upset at the deaths on the Arcadia. He sees this mission as his way of making the sacrifice that all those men made worth something. I like this Carl a lot better, but I digress. We get what I like to call a walk and talk tutorial. You've already started playing the mission, and the tutorial feels as hands off as it can be. We get introduced to the new melee and climbing systems, not to mention the one where you oh shit, I just realized I don't have a shorthand for what the system is called. You know, there's a pulley that you can destroy that drops a bunch of important shit on an enemy? Yeah, that one. So we use it here to fuck up these old ruins, dropping some cannons on these soldiers. Finally, cracking open our map, we can see the new design, how giant it is, and also how better represented the side objectives are. As someone who doesn't mind the Bethesda sort of map where you can just start in one corner and kind of work your way down to see anything, what is actually satisfying about it is having a plan of attack and being able to hit everything you need without doubling back and forth from area to area. And by not zeroing in on a specific area, but giving us a rough zone to search for objectives, it doesn't feel like I'm just checking objectives off my list. It feels a little bit earned. When we finally pop out of the ruins, we can see just how how diverse this island zones are, not to mention the sight lines at work here. As someone who likes to plan, I can figure out how I want to handle like three or four of the encounters from right here. We've got sight lines up the ass and I love it. Speaking about the objectives, SE4 continues to have some quite varied ones. Like for example, in this level, we find out that blowing up the Orchidia was part of a propaganda effort and there are destructible cameras all over the place. Yes, it's still something we need to destroy, but it's not a gun emplacement. Well, at the time at least. And one thing that I noticed based on how much I died is that enemies aren't plain to see. Like I think up until now, it's been pretty obvious where the enemies are. They just kind of stand out from the environmental design and I never really felt like they were sneaking up on me, but that is no more because these guys were much harder to spot. 
Not like they're blending in easier, but they look like they belong in this game world. So when observing a location with my binoculars, it's way more likely that I'll jump over them by accident. Anyway, I push further and drop down into this little cove where I'm hidden away from the masses above, and I realize just how much of a role verticality is going to play in my ability to sneak around. It's stressing me the fuck out right now, but I would eventually come to love it. Could do without footsteps that are 10 meters up sounding like they're right next to me, but hey, we can't all be perfect. Take the winding passage connecting the cove slash beach area further inland, and I gotta say, I love how interconnected this map is. It's not quite Dark Souls 1, but I definitely feel like keeping my eyes peeled for back entrances is going to work to my advantage. I take out the first officer. I wanted to hit him with a chained explosion, but I messed that up, but it's fine because I eventually got him with a barrel kill. Sneaking up to the villa and lurking in the bushes just gave me pure sniper leaf vibes. All the systems felt great. It's like doing a really complex movement when you're lifting and you can feel all your muscles working and firing when they need to. Everything is going according to plan and it just feels great. I was able to take out a guard and even after getting spotted, just set some traps and waited for these guys to come to me. Easy peasy. Also, I opened a safe here, which once again reaffirms how key it is to search the bodies of everyone, but especially high ranking officers. Could I have just blown the door off? Yes. Do I feel accomplished for being able to handle this silently? Absolutely. The documents we loot from the safe or the general, I can't remember because I blew up a lot of people just then, references a man named Kessler, who is presumably our next target. Okay, so our next mission is Batani Village. This is one of my favorites. Besides being very diverse in its geography, it's just fucking beautiful to look at. So yeah, we're on the hunt for Andreas Kessler, a guided rocket scientist, and as Carl puts it, Philanderer. Alcoholic. Committed Nazi. Kessler is being protected by a general named Heinz Bowman, not to be confused with Heinz 57 Varieties. By the way, did you know that they called it 57 Varieties because the creator thought it sounded cooler? Yeah, I guess he saw a billboard. Did you think you'd learn that in this Sniper Elite 4 review? If the answer is no, then you must subscribe. Those are the rules, I don't make them. Anyway, the beginning of this mission has us at what I'll call our forward operating base, which will be a theme that continues throughout the rest of the missions. This is a safe area populated by friendly NPCs, all with their own stories and sometimes missions to give you. You're going to want to check in on the radio before leaving too. Carl, as Red Fox, will radio SOE Command, called Mother Hen, who will give you side objectives before you take off. Neutralize mobile radio operator before he can summon reinforcements. Also, deal with the sniper. Out. Red Fox out. This is also where we meet Jack Weaver for the first time. Jack sounds like Spongebob. There's no two ways about it. Yep, they told me you were a to the point kind of guy. The other guy here is a partisan by the name of Giancarlo. He's sick, which sounds like it'll be important later, but more importantly, he says he's here to take Carl to the partisans. Before we head to Batanti Village, we find out that the Nazis have been committing a, oh sweet Jesus, how do I say that? Rastrelamento. Oh, that's actually not hard at all. This is where they gather citizens at random, and, well, you'll see. Taking a look at some of the objectives, here my favorite, even though it's just a side quest of sorts, is to take out a particular sniper holed up in an old building quite a ways out. Now, I'm a sucker for counting sniping missions, but the road to get there is what really makes it for me. Remember how I talked about the verticality of the maps and how it puts you in a state of unease because you feel like you constantly have to be looking over your shoulder? Well, guess what? Boats. Yep, looks like the Germans got the Lego City expansion set because they now have boats at their disposal, and besides spotting you, they will tear you the fuck up with their MGs if you get anywhere near them. Between the boat making the rounds and the soldiers further on in the city and the sniper taking pot shots at me, I literally had to bob and weave my way forward. I almost had to treat the game like a cover shooter when it's really not, but I think that speaks to the sort of synergy of all the game's mechanics feeling like they're finally on the same page. The tools I need to support me are there and using them is simple. I might just be taking cover in some bushes, but it really feels like more than that. I get into an amazing flow state of sorts where I'm accounting for multiple targets in multiple locations and everything is just working as it should. This is the definitive sniper lead experience. Not this game or level specifically, but the feeling. If I could feel like this all the time, I'd drive to make out point with Rebellion. I'm not going to go all the way though. I'm not that kind of YouTuber. So I actually dispatched the sniper rather quickly, but then they hit me with some turntables. I gotta go desecrate his corpse. I mean, loot him for his valuables and war memorabilia. Getting into the town itself, I am absolutely blown away at the sound and environmental design. First we've got loudspeakers blaring propaganda, which seems to bounce off every surface and reverberate through the bones of this abandoned city. Awesome and unnerving. 
And as far as the environment goes, this is a town that feels lived in, recently enough that the lack of anyone feels like a wound. Even something as hilarious and stereotypical as a basket of bread strewn across the ground. Like, I almost wonder if that bread's still hot. When we get into the main square and we start to see partisans who were lined up and gunned down, we start to see where everybody's gone. Once we read the partisans HQ, we see that their leader, Sophia, has taken them to the town's castle to fight the Germans. Oh, and as we get to the castle, we find the red carpet has been rolled out for us. Carpet is red because it's covered in blood, and it must be windy because there are dead fascists strewn all across the place to keep that carpet weighed down. We finally meet Sophia, the angel, and oh boy does she have chemistry with Carl. Comedic chemistry, of course. We need to talk. The SOE sniper. Nice of you to join us. <laughs> The next level is Regilino Viaduct, and this is the first big set piece level of the game. A set piece is what I'm calling it when Sniper Elite turns into a bit of a Michael Bay-esque wet dream, by the way. Sophia says there are no Carls allowed in her club because they've been dicked around by the Allies one too many times, so he has to pass a test, blowing up a railgun that's conveniently parked on an old viaduct. Before we head out, we call in SOE and get another side mission, to recover footage from a crashed spy plane and blow up the wreck. They are leaning into the sabotage and enemy disruption hard in this game, and I love it. Securing spy footage, blowing up friendly tech so it doesn't fall into enemy hands, yes! Rolling up on the crashed plane is just a really solid encounter. The enemies aren't dug in that much. It does feel like a random scene of devastation that, that they stumbled upon and are only now securing, which is why these bitches ain't shit and I blowed that plane up. Some of the other optional objectives are blowing up a fuel dump and blowing up an armored car that's patrolling the map. It's nice to have a dynamic target like this that we can observe, anticipate its movements, and our use our tools to destroy it in that way. In the past, when we've had to destroy vehicles, they either weren't moving or were already alerted to our presence. But let's dig into the meat and potatoes of this mission, or pasta and marinara. So we take out the initial guards around the railgun and sneak down to the lower structure of the viaduct to place some explosive charges. Some people think that big explosions are dumb. I want it converted into pharmaceutical form and to take it as a pill. I swear, that would put Pfizer out of business. So I plant the charge, run away, and make that big beautiful bridge go boom. It feels like I don't have too much to say about this mission. It's really not that, it's just a really great gameplay level. The synergistic feeling that I mentioned earlier is stronger than ever, and rather than writing jokes or taking notes on nitpicky details, I was focusing on enjoying my time. All right, we're headed to Lorino Dockyard. Weaver says there's a large security presence there, which means something important is being shipped in and shipped out. Because of Operation Husky, there are allied bombers in the area awaiting Carl's signal to blow whatever he finds sky high. For side objectives, we have to disable the air defenses and blow up a weapons cache the Germans have received. But let's see what our partisan friends have for us before we head out. Talking to Lucio, we find out that the harbor master is corrupt and they want him to be made an example of. This is already a way more interesting setup than the Germans have something secret go find out what it is. Giancarlo, on the other hand, isn't doing too hot, but he's keeping it to himself because of how much the angel has to deal with. Apparently her father, the original leader of the partisans, was taken by Bohm's men, and besides feeling the weight of responsibility to lead her already decimated force, is a little hesitant to take over because that would mean accepting her father is really gone. When Carl speaks to Sophia, he holds back that he knows anything about her father, observing her sharpening his old blade. I don't think this is Carl being cautious about revealing how much he knows, but rather not trying to make her feel forced to talk about. Regardless, she confirms that until they find her father's body, she won't stop hoping that he's still alive, but then quickly changes the conversation to the task at hand. There's a shipment of typhus vaccines being kept on the docks and would like us to intercept them for the partisans. Hold on, Giancarlo, daddy's coming. Creeping up on the dockyard, this is the first mission where I really take the suppressed ammo for a spin. You get a lot less of that, and I don't think it has the same stopping power as the unsuppressed version, but I really enjoyed using it to trigger all the explosion I can. Getting into the main storage area is where I encounter the great swinging lights I mentioned earlier, and these lend themselves to some great tactical gameplay. For everything I feel like this mission doesn't do well, I'm having trouble putting a lot of it into words. It's more so that I'm not having fun with it, but since this is a game where even the worst missions are far better than Sniper Elite 1, I do have some good things to say. I think this level really demands proper use of the stealth mechanics and that you benefit from following them rather than deviating and blowing literally everything up. The dynamic and destructible lighting really lends itself to this idea, not to mention the absolute asset of security. Also, a funny little detail when running around, we see this phrase written on a lot of the chalkboards and graffitied places, which when translated reads, no more thefts, look for mafia scum, which considering we're in Sicily where the mafia was born is very on brand and I am here for it. Later on in the mission, we actually read a letter that confirms the identity of the thief as Raphael Marachin, who is the nephew of mafia boss Salvatore Dinelli. 
Anyway, I find the vaccines and learn that the mysterious shipments are radio control components that were on their way to Allegra, north of Lorino. You'd think we'd be going there next, but you'd be wrong. Abrunza Monastery is next, and it's one of the best levels. So I meet Salvatore Dinelli, the mafioso mentioned in the correspondence by the corrupt harbormaster. Our goal is to get him to help the allies and the partisans. Since the mafia aided the allies during Operation Husky, this wouldn't be anything new. We meet with Dinelli, and uh, I'm sorry, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Ah, a 1913 bottle of Montenasca. Giorno Felice. What is that accent? Call me Salvatore. It will suffice. Like, the accent is so weird that my brain has a delay when transcribing what the fuck he's trying to say. This doesn't sound like an Italian accent. You can begin with Piero Capo, the leader of the Black Brigade. It sounds like you gave someone a script and the words broken up phonetically and then had them watch The Godfather Part 1 to teach them how Italians speak. Well, this from a slice of gabagool. Okay, if there's one thing I will personally box someone over is the argument that this might be the best mission in the whole game. I love it. It's just got a classic Italian vibe. There's a great amount of rewarding the player for their exploration with tunnels and such, and the environment is the chef's kiss I've been waiting for. Just so good, so much fun. Also, this is the level that finally made me lament that you don't really need to kill everyone to succeed. This is a piece of advice every game has provided since the very first, and I've just kind of gone hold my beer and proceeded to chop down entire family trees. And the irony is, I only came to this conclusion because of the last objectives to kill all the enemies within a certain area. As I did, I realized how much I didn't want to be doing this. Maybe I just don't like being told what to do, but for the sake of argument, let's say it's not that because I can't have that kind of personal growth during a Sniperly 4 review. Let's wait until 5 to become a better person. Sneaking through this villa has my blood absolutely pumping. My hands are getting sweaty, I'm forgetting to blink, I'm so keyed in they might as well be keys of cocaine. Climbing through the catacombs or whatever they're called, we get up into the monastery and collect the final documents that absolve the abbot of blame. His seeming cooperation with the fascists was purely meant as a means to help smuggle people out of the city. Okay, now that the heartwarming stuff is over, let's kill everything in sight. <laughs> dead. Carl took his cross, but I'm positive it's only because he didn't have room to bring the Capo's decapitated noggin. Okay, Megazano facility. We start out talking to this handsome son of a bitch, Weaver's contact, Dorfman. God damn, Carl just feels very well written and animated in this game. Like, I've always bought who he was and understood his character, but this game is just the first one where he seems to experience any subtlety in his range of emotions, rather than being shoot man kill 24-7. We saw this when he spoke about the Orchidae at the beginning of the game, where he's actually sad about the deaths of the crew. He treats the angel with respect, not just as a leader, but by knowing what threads to pull and what buttons to push. With the mafia, he's obviously holding them at arm's length, not afraid to treat them as an ally of opportunity and vocalize this right to their faces. And here, talking to Dorfman, he makes it clear he doesn't trust him worth a shit, but doesn't have a reason so far outside of being cautious of a traitor. I love how he's being handled, and I hope this categorization carries forward into SE5. Okay. For our various side objectives in this mission, the big one is to blow up the giant radar dish on this map. As I'm starting the mission, I realize something blatant to anyone paying attention, which is why I missed it. But if you take your time scanning an enemy with the binoculars, you actually get a bio. You get their name, what equipment they're carrying, and get to learn about their hopes and dreams. Almost, Almost makes me feel bad about killing them. Almost. I don't have much to say about this mission. It's one that's heavy on the blowing shit up train. You've got the radio tower, the big gun, the slightly smaller guns, the portable guns, and these guns. Wrapping up, once I get inside the compound, I find these awesome blue glowing bastards. I'm sure you know what comes next. Our final task is to grab Andreas Kessler, who is absolutely off his tits on booze, and load him into this pickup. I have to admit, my constant anxiety at the fact that Carl didn't put up the tailgate is palpable. I think it has a smell. It's not just Kessler. Opening on mission 7, we see a bound Kessler surrounded by all our favorite sniper Lee pals. Sophia is pacing like, like a college student when the riddling kicks in and there's nothing left to clean, and should she be here? Like is it smart to have this dude, no gag, just able to speak freely? Cause he starts egging her on, and then we get a really dramatic scene where she wants to kill him, but Weaver is trying to logic his way out of a cardboard box with her. Like bro, why do any of the partisans need to be here right now? I'm assuming they were interrogating him, but then they all gladly leave the room when he offers to tell her about what happened to her father. Like, no, shut this shit down, Carl. I don't care how thirsty you are for that tea. Think just because Weaver took her knife, she can't bludgeon this Nazi with a fucking table leg? You know what? I don't really care to examine any of this lead up anymore. Kessler's dying. Sophia took her partisans to the interrogation block where her father is allegedly being held, and Boehm has a bestie named Rothbauer that happens to be in the same town. 
for secondary objectives, we have another counter sniping mission, which is always a time and a half. I don't mean to snipe shame, but I gotta say that I think he deserves this one. I literally walked into one of his explosives downstairs and was still able to sneak up on him for a melee takedown. As a sniper, isn't that like his only weakness? This is a map that has quite a lot to see, and trust me, you're gonna see most of it because you are running around a lot in this mission. No more than the other ones, but I think because the objectives are just so bland and samey by now, it starts to feel a little played out. Let's just say my footage for this level was about an hour and 15 minutes, and I was shocked seeing that, as I was convinced it had to have been at least two. As the mission draws to a close, we'll find the partisans in parts, and the angel nowhere to be seen. A massacre. one mission left. Let's see where this takes us. In the cutscene for the final mission of Sniper Elite 4's campaign, we get a fairly concise summary of what we've discovered so far. Although the attempted mic drop comes from the revelation that Bohm's key target is the USS Ancon, command ship for Operation Avalanche, no other than Dwight D. Eisenhower on board. It's fine motivation, but because we finished up Sniper Elite 3 with a plot to kill Churchill, this does feel a little bit like the logical conclusion for a Sniper Elite game. It just feels a little predictable. So we get dropped off at Allegra Fortress by the Mafia, and they remind us that their mom can drop us off, but our mom needs to pick us up. This is the location we discovered a little bit earlier was the headquarters for Bohm's experimental tech. And it's a snow level? Have we had a snow level before? And right off the bat, we get a primo blowing shit up opportunity. But only if we're quick on the draw, and you best believe that we sure as shit are gonna reload the save to pull this off, because I have the reflexes of a mostly empty ketchup bottle. Yeah, I don't know what that means either. I found this mission to be satisfactory. It technically got an A, it has all the things I like in Sniper Elite, and all the boxes are checked, but I feel bored by that. I'm struggling to find anything noteworthy outside of the big moments that I want to talk about, and I've rewatched my game footage like two or three times now. It's cool that it was a sort of new locale for the series, the outdoor section right before we find our way inside the fortress is entirely adequate, and the musical tracks are fantastic. <laughs> Something that was done remarkably well was interactions between the enemy. Pretty close to the entrance, I hear a young soldier get stopped by an officer. The officer asks why the soldier is patrolling in this particular area, and the soldier informs the officer that in the attack on Megazano, an enemy soldier snuck in via an unguarded section. So the soldier, on his own volition, started patrolling where he thought the enemy soldier might be found. Unfortunately, that information hasn't been sent out on German or Italian radio stations, meaning the soldier must have tampered with his radio to be able to intercept Allied transmissions. The officer essentially says that later on he's going to inspect the soldier's radio, and if it's been fiddled with, he's going to have the soldier executed. What an awesome little encounter to stumble over. It's a concise narrative and one I found very intriguing. I was already on board with reading documents you pick up off of dead bodies hearing this, and knowing there might be more to find out, this became my singular purpose. Keep in mind, I overheard this exchange, so I don't know who it was, so I killed everybody. The payoff was not what I'd hoped. So anyway, I make my way through the facility. I destroy the radio-controlled missiles, which made me feel like I was going crazy because there was one I just could not find, and I sabotage the hydrogen peroxide facility that's here. Both of these tasks are a little boring since you're just tracking down multiples. There are five missiles and four parts of the plant to destroy, and once I kill everybody, it basically just became running from location to location, doing the same thing multiple times. I don't know, it felt a little bit like padding to me. I guess if I was trying to play it stealthy, it would have been a little bit more difficult or engaging, but it felt like the game really wanted me to go that way anyway. But just as I think I'm going to blow this popsicle stand, I get cut off from calling the bombers by Dorfman. Oh, phew. Good thing you're here, man. Good thing you brought your own gun. I always got my six. Bring it in here! I failed, Carl. I failed them all. I failed my father. Yo. See, there is no hope here. Yeah. Not anymore. They're going to torture her. Yeah. And, uh, you're going to watch, <laughs> Lieutenant. <laughs> all it takes is a spark. Wait, is he the bad guy? 
For real though, I knew there was no way we wouldn't get the bad guy monologue, but am I ever pleased they shot her in the fucking head? Not that I disliked the angel by any means, but because I didn't expect it. I use this term sparingly because there's an army of game journalists that come running whenever they hear the signature call of a hack writer reviewing a game, but it definitely subverted my expectations. Chasing Boehm, I watch him get in a plane and fly away. Wait, are they going to get me to shoot this plane up? And after putting a dozen shots into this fucking plane, I watch it reach speed and fly away. And just as I was about to restart from the last point... Wait, is it coming back? Yes, yes, yes. I don't care how unrealistic. I don't care if Sniper Elite just jumped the shark. I just shot a plane out of the sky with an M1. God damn, this series gives me everything I want just as I want it. Oh, hold on. Carl's going to outrun a fucking drone strike. Give him a minute. I know I say it all the time, but Carl's so fucking cool. For our first foray into the DLC, we're going to look at the Let's Kill Hitler mission for SE4. The map we get to play on in this mission is quite good. Actually, it's amazing. We start outside and have to navigate our way through these sea forts inside the U-boat facility. But first, we have to start from the beginning. And if I'm going to do that right, you got to meet the crew. <gasps> Lothar the Lung TV, Long Range Specialist. Think Carl's got the itchiest trigger finger? I wouldn't hold your breath. Admiral Herman, Hangman Richter, known for hiding in plain sight. He always said the key to getting your lips that perfect shade of blue was a flask full of Kool-Aid. Neil's mama's boy Meyer. Sure, he's always sending letters back home, but his mom could totally beat up your mom. And, uh, who am I? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm a 306 round, and I don't fuck around. Only shots I'm interested in are either 90 proof or bad and round by the Okay, I think I've distracted you enough to get inside. This mission offers a few ways to off the doll. My favorite is the most extra yet. You set up near the entrance and just hang out until Hitler eventually walks under this U-boat cradle and... God damn, that was so good. Let's watch that one more time. You can also cap him in his boat or just blow up the whole facility. If you have more patience than me, you can also drop a depth charge on him, but I've been eyeing the next DLC mission for a while now. It's called Death Storm. What's it about? It doesn't matter. It's called Death Storm. Okay, so Deathstorm finds us in the middle of Operation Strangle, an interdiction campaign to destroy German supply lines en route to the front in northern Italy. Oh, interdiction means, quote, steady bombardment of enemy positions and communication lines for the purpose of delaying and disorganizing progress. I just learned that word, and I, I needed an excuse to use it. Where was I? Oh yeah, so alongside Operation Strangle is the Alsos mission. It was part of the Manhattan Project and was meant to keep tabs on enemy progress on atomic, chemical, and biological weapons. I'm not going to get into the whole history because this script is already over 16,000 words long, but I wanted to set the stage. I wanted to play the music. I wanted to light the lights. Carl's role here is twofold. There's a mysterious package on its way into the port at Rocca Mare, and where there's a package to be grabbed, there's gonna be a Carl. The other job is to neutralize the various defenses so that the Allies can fuster cluck the daylights out of this sleepy seaside town. This is another snow mission. I hate to boil down missions into such simple nomenclature, but the filing system in my brain runs dial-up speeds, and I need to keep things simple. Anyway, I found it fairly enjoyable. One of the side objectives here is to grab the logbooks from one of the two ships currently in the harbor, and you need to determine which one has the contents we're looking for through careful observation, investigation, and I just, I just ran into both. It was this one. For the mysterious package side of things, we find this one contains gift wrap plutonium, marked with the words Todesturm or Death Storm. The Nazis have some kind of wonder weapon that only Carl can stop. Oh no. So we meet up with our contacts and get the briefcase back to the Alsos project. Okay, why do they not put the gate up when they put important shit in trucks? Did they not have tailgates in 1943? Were they not invented yet or something? That shit is gonna go flying the second the driver takes a hairpin turn. Not that Italy has any of those or anything. Fuck. Death Storm Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, is pretty great. You have to track down a propaganda minister, among other things, but what makes it great is the introduction of the, oh wow, how did I write this down thinking I could pronounce it? Fallschirm, 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 Fallschirm Jaeger, Fallschirm Jaeger. 
These are the kind of soldiers who either listen to Back in Black on their way to a job, or just sit in total silence. Known as Valkyrie Squad, they're an elite section of the Jaegers that you lure to your position with a fake radio call. They roll up, park their half-tracks like they're introducing the villain of a Fast and Furious movie, and roll out. They're all clad in black, their leader is wearing an absolute bang and fit. Everything about them screams elite, including their actual screams. Yeah, I died to these guys so many times that, knowing where they were going to show up, I put down so much shrapnel it'd make the Laotian rats that sniff out landmines have a stroke. Otherwise, I don't have much to say. The end firefight in the library where we have to shoot our way out is kind of cool, but I'd be lying if I said that I had any concept of what happened here story-wise. I'm sure we'll learn about it in the intro to the next mission. Okay, so this is Analog speaking to you from Writing Land, and before I get into this level, I need you to know that the only note I have marked under this mission, like I take notes and stuff as I'm playing so I can get back into the headspace as I watch back footage, and the only note I have written here is Nazi goose is bad. What does that mean? Let's find out. As I promised, the introduction catches me up. Deathstorm itself is a plot to irradiate the allies during the D-Day landings. I don't think this would have mattered much since a contributing factor to the Allies' success during D-Day is the fact that Rommel, the man handpicked by Hitler to defend Normandy, went home to surprise his wife for her birthday, meaning that the chuckle fucks he left in charge had no sweet clue of what to do. The moral of the story? Don't be a Nazi. Storm your wife's speeches instead. Tell her I said hi while you're at it. Our final objective for the Deathstorm DLC is to visit this charming little town and blow up a nuclear reactor. Hashtag just Carl things. We have a variety of objectives here. We have to collect some research papers, destroy some vehicles, investigate some weird noises, and funny enough, we have to knock out a scientist and kidnap them to do Carl things to him. Even funnier, the objective is called Scrambled Eggheads. I love it. The research collection is simple enough, don't need to spend much time here. The noises mentioned are in the mines, and I heard they might be haunted, so call me Carl Baggins. Let's do some exercising. That's exercising with an O, not, not an E. Once we get inside the mines, it's not ghosts, but it sure is scary. There are stockpiles of allied armaments, uniforms, and flags, and the Germans are planning on conducting false flag operations behind enemy lines. I totally buy this. They actually did that in Poland, which they used to justify the utter bulldozing of a sovereign nation, but with the power of hindsight, we all know that was just Germany's warm-up set. All we have to do here is blow up one red barrel to take the entire complex down, but I still really enjoyed it as an objective because it was something at least different. I chose to knock out Joseph Wernicke, definitely not just because he was the only scientist I hadn't accidentally killed, more so just because his name sets me up for a joke of some kind if I draw a dick on his face while he's asleep. I thought the Alsos boys would appreciate that. Carrying him around was a fucking pain. Not only do you walk slower, but you can't use any weapons. It's like the worst version of an escort mission. Ultimately, I tossed the boy because blowing up fuel trucks sounds a bit more fun. Yep, it was fun. Oh, I forgot to mention, but in a bit of foreshadowing here, we're stealing the scientists' papers because they were working on V2 rockets, which we end up dealing with in, well, V2. Anyway, infiltrating the reactor is a lot of fun. They play on the fact that this is a dangerous industrial facility by having pipes full of steam that you can sabotage to take people out, which is cool. So we sabotage the reactor and kill a Borsch or Bosk or whatever the fuck his name is and make our way out of the facility to escape. Unfortunately, the Super Jaegers show up looking for a fight. I just sprint at the end. Fortunately, when we load up the still twitching body of the scientist into the back of the truck, Carl puts the fucking tailgate up. Not that I'm holding out hope, that man has been unconscious for way too long not to have Benoit levels of CTE. The reactor waits until we're a safe distance away, Carl desecrates a church, and oh, goose. Nazi goose. I get the joke now. No one plays it. SC4 has four main co-op modes. Campaign, which I've got nothing to say about, it's the campaign with other people. Then there's Survival, which is the wave-based horde mode, and Overwatch, which the game calls Asynchronous Spotter and Sniper Gameplay. First up is Survival. Okay, so Survival is the one that we've seen before. It's not reinventing the wheel, it's not breaking any new ground. It's a wave-based survival challenge. Simple, hard to really fuck up in any discernible way. I played this one with my brother and we didn't really have too much trouble. We were on Cadet because he's newer to these kind of games and my commitment to capturing the average gamer's experience isn't as strong as my desire to game with my brother. So we had a decent time. There were a few instances where we noticed how disjointed the map felt at times. Like there are independent zones on the map where your base will spawn and require you to defend it. But then when you're on the other side of the map, 
the game will spawn in a tank or two, but it's like on the complete other side with no enemies around it. So you end up killing all the infantry, waiting until the end, and then blowing it up with very little threat of defeat. Now, Overwatch, on the other hand, no, not that one, was the game mode I was the most surprised with how much I enjoyed it. It's not a new game type for Sniper Elite, but it's also not one I've really played much before. I think with the passage of time and hearing about it enough, I just kind of built up in my head an expectation of what it was like. But once things kicked off, man, what a great concept and what better execution. The first time we played it, I was the sniper due to me being the better shot, and my brother was the operative due to his newfound love for silent takedowns. Seriously, this kid will sit there and wait as long as he has to for his target to turn his back. In other words, he don't give a fuck about your armor lock. Anyway, we played through the train yard mission and holy shit, what a visceral and engaging feeling. My palms were sweaty. I realized I'd forgotten to breathe a few times. I was dialed the fuck in. Our usual banter slowly faded away. All we did was call our shots, give short and precise updates. We were laser focused on this mission and the minutes felt like seconds. As the guards would close in around him and he got close to being spotted, my brain would race. Lateral thinking and problem solving skills honed over months of playing nothing but these fucking games kicked in. It was a video game, sure, but that was my brother out there and I had to keep him safe. Very rarely do I get keyed into a game like this. When we talk about immersion, usually we talk about the simulation aspect. We see and hear what our character in game does. It's about distracting us from the world we inhabit that slowly brings the player into the game world using these techniques. But this kind of immersion is something else entirely. I'm going to tell you something only somebody who spent the last three months playing the Sniper Elite games would know. SE4 has the most named NPCs of any game so far, and that's a good thing. I think we've reached a point with Carl where he alone can't carry these games. Could he? Definitely. But I think we're seeing the parts of Carl's personality and who he is as a character that can only be uncovered and developed based on his interactions with others. His inner monologue was always fantastic in the cutscenes, but those were a lot of business. Not that Carl in SE4 isn't all business, but there are moments of brevity that we only got glimpses of. Dealing with Stefan and Tomas in Sniper Elite 1, his concern for Ephraim Schreiger in V2, his bromance with Brower in 3, those are the main times we saw Carl as anything other than a cool guy killing machine, but in SE4 we have a ton. His worry for Giancarlo, his barely inaudible disgust of the Mafia, the back and forth of his loyalties to the SOE and his obligations to the OSS, they might not be in your face but they are present, and it's a step in the right direction for the franchise. Carl is not a silent protagonist, but there are elements of immersion that work best when we pretend he is, and we need to be conscious that a foot in both worlds is going to require more discipline to maintain. Not impossible, but not a walk through Carl's horse either. Now, I hope this isn't going to make me sound disingenuous. I am under no illusions that Sniper Elite is a gameplay first franchise. Right after spending four paragraphs talking about the story, those are just the aspects that stand out the most to me. Also, because it's a space I wanted to praise for improvement and doing something that I enjoyed and that matters to me, because the gameplay as it is, is as tight as it's ever been. I'm really racking my brain for the um actuallys that might crop up, but I'm having trouble identifying what they might be. Traversal and movement mechanics are what they need to be, the gunplay is even tighter, and the AI can not only be challenging but intelligent and reactive to the player. If my main complaints are with some of the graphical presentations and the vocal performances, I don't think it should be emphasized. Sniper Elite is about the gameplay. That's where I think it's going to live or die, and why people are going to be playing it in 5, 10, 20 years when the graphics and the vocal performances aren't going to hold up anyway. Those demerits are fleeting, and I'd rather not bang on about them. However, something that does deserve a mention are the sources that help me out the most. Of course, thanks again to Colin Harvey for getting back to me. Once again, make sure to go check out The Hero Never Dies on Unbound. The link is going to be in the description. But for other sources, when I started researching this topic, it quickly became apparent that there was a lot of history that got tossed in the blender with your standard World War II hyperbole, with a heavy dose of Cosa Nostra Mythos slipped in. Man, I said that in one take. I had three main sources for this section. The first was the article I mentioned in the peer-reviewed journal Italian Americana, titled Italian Americans and the Invasion of Sicily in World War II by Stefano Luconi. This is my more grounded resource, it didn't feel too caught up in sensationalism and heroics. My second resource was The Luciano Project by Rodney Campbell. This is a book from 1977 that reads a bit like an action novel, but it has its own sources, and was close enough to the time frame described to be topical, but far enough away that it can function as more of a post-mortem of all the events mentioned. Also, shout out to the internet archive for having this available. I knew it was going to be a nightmare to track down a 45-year-old book, but they made it super easy. Finally, my last source was the impetus for a lot of Rodney Campbell's book, the actual 1954 report from New York Commissioner of 
investigations, William B. Herland's secret investigation into the activities of the OSS and U.S. Naval Intelligence. And reading through the original type report is nothing short of exhilarating. If you're not a nerd, you might not understand that, but I'm happy to take that bullet for you. And that's that. Make sure to like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe. And if you know someone you think might like this video, share it with them. Seriously, for the people out there that like what I do and want me to do more, the more people we can get watching, the better. We're closing in on 100 subscribers, and you know what? I want to do 250 by 2023. That's right, printed on some shirts. 250 by 2023. It worked for Johnny Cochran, and by God, it'll fucking work for me. Thanks for watching. This has been an escape from my analog nightmare. Good luck in yours. Oh,